Hi, Christina here, founder of Liberate. I wanted to let you know that all of our amazing practitioners, healers, and intuitives are available for remote sessions. And we are continuously adding new classes, workshops, and meditations to serve you every week. Thank you for joining us, and I hope that we can help you liberate yourself. Hi, this is Christina Dam, and this is Liberate the Podcast, where we educate, motivate, inspire, and liberate your consciousness. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Liberate the Podcast. Today, we're bringing back one of our family members. She's done so many uh, workshops with us in the past, Katherine Allman. She does tantric workshops with us. She's also a remarkable author. This is her new book here, Guide to Spiritual mm-hmm. LA. And she's also a marriage family therapist, whole bunch of different toolbox or tools in her toolbox that she offers to help and transform people's lives and become more aware of who they are. Today, we're deep diving into this and also hearing a little bit more about the workshops and things that she has coming up in and around the area and now in the world of Zoom, they're mm-hmm. able to be accessed no matter where you're at. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Welcome. Hi, Christina. Hi, everybody. Nice to be back. Nice to have you back. And so, you know, I want to I wanna dive in and first and foremost, what made you think about doing a guide to spiritual LA <laughs> and where'd that come from? And then, yeah, let's go from there. Yeah, I um, always like to drive around LA and explore spots that I'd heard of. I've been a spiritual person forever. And so I would find these places that, and my friends would go, how did you know about that? And I'd be like, well, I just researched it. And then I would go to another place and the people would go, how did you know about that? And I would uh, research that. And then I started thinking other people might like to know these places. Plus, I got really tired of my friends who live in other cities saying, oh, LA, it's so superficial. Ew, LA. <laughs> and I'm like, I love LA. It's actually very spiritual there. And so this is uh, about the spiritual LA. I like that. And I feel like it's such an important topic at this time, especially for, you know, if people are coming and you're traveling into LA, <laughs> you know, to find the soul of LA. But also exactly. for a lot of the LA locals, if you're looking for things in this trying time, of places to regain some sense of meaning, connection, or whatever else may be, uh, I think people need the spiritual connection more than ever now. I think so too. And I think that also with the fact that we can't travel anywhere, we can travel in our own city, we can put masks on, go check out some of these sites, there's beautiful places to sit and rest, beautiful places to feel what I call the Shakti, which I'm sure a lot of you know what that means, where there's just an outpouring of spiritual energy. And that can be very renewing at a time like this. So instead of going traveling to wherever we might like to go, we can go in our own beautiful city and find find and discover that sense of what we always like when we're traveling, finding and discovering new exciting places that have meant a lot to people for for a long time. You know how my book's sitting there, it looks like it has a starfish coming out of it with a plant. (laughs) (laughs) It's got little legs here and then its little head. (laughs) That's the halo effect on my book there. Yeah, see, it's it's spiky. (laughs) Um, No, and and, and so you had this, uh, you were constantly giving your friends and other people advice and having people question LA and how you can live here and the superficialness of it. And so you said, okay, well, let me, let me take all my knowledge and experience and all the places that I discovered and write about it. Now, when you were writing the book, did you also go on expeditions to discover other ones to include? Definitely. I'd heard about things. So I went there because I wanted to photograph everything. So the book is full of photographs. I just want to tell people that this I was thinking if I first heard this subject, I might go, oh, that sounds heavy. But it's really, um, it's, it's almost more photos than text. And the book is designed to be little blips. So you can just di- uh, dip in and read a little bit and look at the picture and then come back at another time. Yeah, it reminds so, me of like, tra- uh, like a tra- traditional like uh, travel books. That was my idea. Was yeah, yeah. A little bit like a travel book because I've got little tours you can take and so on. 
Yeah, I yeah. mean, and then and if you want to expand on this, not that I'm pushing that out there, but if you ever do, you could be d- making these spiritual guides to other cities in and around the United <laughs> States of the world. That's what a book marketer said to me. She says, you're going to do this for every city? I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you could. But that's amazing. So definitely um, tell me about a couple of your favorite places that uh, were some of the ones that were your tried and true favorites and then maybe while you were writing the book and 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 creating and putting this together what are some new ones that you discovered that you weren't even you didn't even know about before you set out on the venture of doing it yeah well one thing i discovered is there's so many uh interesting strange and uh successful spiritual groups cults uh associations or whatever that have come together right in hollywood so hmm. I really uh, had, you know, been reading about vortex energy, and I realized that Hollywood is a powerful spiritual vortex. It's ruled by the planet Neptune, which in astrology is dreams and visions and spirituality. So you have the, of course, it's known for the uh, film industry, but it's mm-hmm. also underneath the surface, it's got, well, it used to have Liberate Hollywood, which was a yeah. very spiritual center. And then you have... I know a little um, bit about that one. <laughs> <laughs> we love that place. And um, it also has uh, the Yogananda Center, the um, Church of Scientology, which not everyone thinks is spiritual, but I write in my book about how if you give it a second chance, there is some good stuff outside of the craziness. Mm-hmm. There is the um, Carol Ryder Foundation, which is a huge astrological institute, there is the uh, Monastery of the Nuns of the Angels, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Okay. And there is the Bonnie Bray House and so on. There's just all these places that, you know, kind of coincidentally all sprung up in the same area that um, psychics had said is permeated with spiritual energy. So I just oh. wanted to start with that. Hollywood is a powerful spiritual vortex, which I'm in, sure you were drawn to. In in. Did they, did different psychics or different information when you found, um, talk about cross streets or locations of where these vortexes were in Hollywood? I'm just curious. Well, I think just the whole thing is a vortex. It's not particular this or that. I mean, somebody owes a dowser could maybe figure that out. But I just think the whole thing, in astrology, we see things with their boundaries. So I just think the whole thing of Hollywood is just a profound Everyone doesn't interpret this way, but if you if you can feel it, there's this very strong energy there, and it's it's created a lot of groups. Well, you know, there there has to be some strong energy, regardless of why whether people subscribe to it or not. But it's a location that became the second largest city, soon to be probably the first largest city as New York's losing its population. Mm-hmm in the united states and it's been you know it could have could have been anywhere up and down the coast or it could have been in a different state but yet music and art and film found its way in los angeles and continued to stay here you know for so many years there has to be something to that right i think so and, and i think that wherever these bigger cities are and just like if we go back to you know, Mayan runes or old, old, um, old runes anywhere. Like, you know, they're, they're guided in these cities and these temples are based on the star systems. Right. And so they plotted the points, uh, particularly. And I think that that intuition helps us plot those points too. And so I don't think there's any coincidence of where something gets settled. I mean, we are in the middle of a desert, but look at us. (laughs) Definitely not. So one thing uh, that people don't know about is right in Hollywood is the uh, Monastery of the Angels. I call them the pumpkin bread nuns because there's some cloistered nuns there, which means I had to look that up. Cloistered means they never come out and um, interact with us. They just stay inside. But um, And they one of the ways they support themselves is by making pumpkin bread. It's really old-fashioned. It's just like Grandma used to make. And, of course, I had to sample it for the book. And, yeah, um, yeah, this sounds like perfect. I mean, you know, this is coming out in time for, for you know, uh, it'll be, it, it, we'll be releasing this next week for Halloween. So, like, it, when people are watching this, but this is perfect. perfect. And then Thanksgiving, you know, pumpkin bread. Perfect. It's perfect. And they are, um, they have what's called the something something of the perpetual adoration. I have to look at my book to get the exact name. But what it means is that there's one of those nuns is praying for us 24-7. 
So they take turns. Wow. There's always someone praying. I'm getting a little rushes just thinking about it. I mean, it's so profound that that in itself creates a vortex energy. So I was wow. talking to a friend of mine, and he was like, nuns, that's kind of creepy. And I'm like, you know what? If that was Tibetan monks in orange robes chanting Om Mane Padme Om 24-7, everyone would think that was just like the most awesome thing in the world. These are nuns who are praying for us and our salvation. I just, I find that very, yeah. very beautiful. So I think that's affecting everybody in L.A., whether we know it or not, to have that blessing always and going on. Where are they located? It's, um, it's, um, I would have to GPS it because it's up on a street. It's close to, um, right, a Beachwood Canyon. A lot of stuff happened in Beachwood Canyon. I think I know what you're talking about. I know, I know where you're talking. I actually have, have stumbled upon that place before. Okay. Did you get the pumpkin bread? No, no, no. I didn't get the <laughs> pumpkin bread. So now I have to go and get the pumpkin bread. I'm yeah. definitely getting the pumpkin bread. So another uh, way you can uh, compare that to the um, Hindu tradition is that a friend pointed out to me that that pumpkin bread, even though it's kind of funny because it's like grandma old-fashioned pumpkin bread, it's also, you could say, it's what they call in the Hinduism prasad because it's been blessed by these nuns. So there's all these things about L.A. spirituality that are kind of just below the surface. So you wouldn't really know that, oh, this is old-fashioned pumpkin bread, but it's been blessed, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. And the benefit that it has on your body, I mean, it's no different than drinking blessed water or wine or different things like that that are through so many different traditions, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and so was that a place that you are already had known about for a while, or is that a new one that you had discovered on? Actually, um, all the time I've been writing this book, people have been coming to me with things that I hadn't heard of. So I, I were to points when I was writing this book, I thought, I am never going to get finished because... <laughs> People keep telling me stuff, and I was actually having my hair done, and my hairdresser said, have you heard about that monastery that Katy Perry is buying? And I'm like, what? So I had to run down there and check it out before she bought it, but it wasn't the one she was buying. But I got this great story that, from it. That, that one was in, like, uh, in Eagle Rock or something, right? The other one she bought? I think so. Okay. But, I mean, how L.A. is that? Which, which monastery is Katy Perry buying? <laughs> <laughs> right uh, so what are, what are some other ones that are really unique I mean I think well, that people should go and get the pumpkin bread and, and have that experience when they're here um, and now is this something that you can walk around and you can you can experience or meditate or 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 is it just something that you go in and you get the bread and you kind of just see the grounds and walk out well the chapel's open I don't know if it is during COVID but the chapel's open you can walk in you can uh, kneel and pray if you choose or just sit and bask in that energy of this constant prayer that's been wow. going on for decades never wow. ceasing it's very very powerful the grounds are pretty uh, but it's mostly to just be in that energy of this constant constant prayer Beautiful. there's another super cool thing in um, greater hollywood it's not actually technically hollywood it's more technically uh, silver lake i think or echo park but there's what's called the bonnie bray house oh what's that <laughs> it's a nondescript house looks like every other little house in the neighborhood looks like a row house except now okay. it's got a sign and in the 30s I think it was a, a preacher named William Seymour a black preacher with one eye had come out from the Midwest and he <laughs> had they had started a little bit speaking in tongues there but okay. it was very small movement and he came here and on I think it was June 6th. I've got the exact date in the book. He was preaching, and the, somebody in the congregation sort of in pure ecstasy falling to the ground and calling out in tongues, and everyone was overcome with this outpouring, and everyone was started speaking in tongues. It was this big break. And what's so fascinating about this story, Christina, is that it started spreading, and people started coming from all around, and people were spreading the word about this outpouring of Shakti and the speaking in tongues. And they said that around this house, I think this was in the 30s, around this house, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And the energy got so high and everyone was dancing and celebrating and testifying, the porch fell off the house. <laughs> what? And this was the birth of Pentecostalism. So you, when you think of Pentecostalism and speaking in tongues, you think that must be from the deep south. It's actually right here from L.A. 
Wow. And it, just it's clarify mind-blowing. for those people that might not understand fully what what is meant by or what is the experience of speaking in tongue because some people might not understand that. Um, it's only something I've read about, but it's uh, apparently people start. I mean, I think we've all kind of talked gibberish at times, just blah, 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 blah. and so it some kind of just natural sound comes out like this, and it actually is a language that people don't understand. Mm-hmm. But it's just, it's moved because people are so moved. The energy, some kind of energy, spiritual energy is moving through them and pouring out. So sometimes people will dance. You yeah. think how you are at a rock show or a, a festival, you're just like, yeah. So it's that kind of joy and exuberance and excitement and happiness coming out in a spiritual sense. Yeah, and I'll elaborate a little bit more. Some people know it as light language, um, different vibrational, um, the, the, the words in the, just like in mantras and the Sanskrit has vibration. A lot of the speaking in tongues holds this energetic vibration that help to activate different mm-hmm. elements within your body. Fantastic. Yeah. So the, the porch fell off from the weight of the people celebrating and they moved down to a place called Azusa Street and that is now known as the birth of the Pentecostal movement. Wow. I, I would have never just thought it was in L.A. This, this little nondescript house. And now the house, is that a house that you can still visit? You can go there. They have tours. Um, okay. I didn't go on a tour. Uh, they even have overnight stays, which I'm not sure about that. But, <laughs> but they have, um, we didn't go on a tour, but we just went down to look at it and photograph it. And a neighbor came out and just gave us the whole scoop and more. It was extremely generous. So maybe the readers will be that lucky if they go down and check it out too. Wow. That's amazing. So cool. I know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that there's, I mean, look at the, the, the size of this book. There's many different things in here. So you know? many fascinating things. There's occult things. There's um, the... Oh, let's talk about that. People will probably find that fascinating, especially with all the conspiracies going on right now. <laughs> well, we have our spiritual rock star, our occult rock star of L.A. Um, do you know about Jack Parsons? I've heard of him. I don't know too much on, on, on I haven't delved into anything well, on This him. is very scandalous and very, um, they did a, a movie called, a uh, uh, series called Strange Angel, which was a fictional account of his life, but he was this super uh, movie star handsome guy named Jack Parsons. It, this was in the, he looked like a 40s movie star, like sort of Clark Gable look. Okay. And he was, uh, he, he was a genius, so he started inventing things for rockets when he was like 12 years old. And he actually was one of the founders of JPL. Okay. The P is for Parsons. So he's, ah. just, he's known, he's still like probably on Wikipedia and so on, as one of the fathers of the rocket industry and so on. And so he was always doing experiments. I think he came up with some kind of rocket fuel. But also when he was 12, he started um, trying to do uh, cult spells to conjure the devil. When he was 12? <laughs> <laughs> and he felt like he actually did, so he didn't uh, continue with that until later. And so later, he took it up again, and he became one of the, he's also known as one of the premier occultists. He wrote quite wow. a few books, and he was a, he became a follower of uh, Aleister Crowley. Okay. Who I, if people don't know who that is, I have a little sidebar explaining who he is in the book. And so here's Jack, he's half- uh, world-class scientist, half world-class occultist, and <laughs> what an interesting, what an interesting because you know m- normally those two worlds don't mix, you know, and so you have one being, you know, in that super spiritual things that you can't see or explain, and then everything that you can explain with equations and mathematics, you know, so it's like those don't tend to blend. So that's an interesting. And he got fired for it when they found out about his occult stuff. Oh, wow. He did, they did a famous uh, ritual called the Babylon Working, which was a ritual he did with L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology before he founded Scientology. They did this occult ritual to uh, conjure the Scarlet Woman and enter, oh, enter the New Age. So this is a famous, uh, the Babylon Working, this famous ritual that they did. And of course, that's extremely scandalous because it's L. Ron Hubbard. The church denies it. <laughs> Wow. And then, unfortunately, um, 
he blew himself up. He died in an accident in his basement. Either this was a, a science experiment or it was as a result of a occult working or it was an accident or there's also speculation that um, the FBI and the uh, Pasadena police were following him and there's some speculation also that it could have been an assassination. But anyway, wow. he died when he was quite young and has still left this uh, mark on spiritual LA as this fascinating and strange and um, rock star. <laughs> wow. Spiritual rock star. It's very and, dark. It's and very is, so that makes me think, isn't the, um, wasn't there another uh, cult, uh, like a cult leader that did the famous murders um, and he led the murders that happened in the, in the, it was a celebrity. Charles Manson? Charles Manson? Yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I was yeah, like, I couldn't, members. I couldn't, like, I did, yeah. I was like, but he was, he was also, um, the, there was like a cult that he was running, right? And then, then they were like fo his followers and stuff. Interesting uh, that a lot of uh, the people of, of, it's intertwined, intertwined, intertwined. Exactly, exactly. Uh, huh. Do you want another scandal? Yes, I want to, the scandals are the interesting things, you know, especially these ones that you don't really like, you don't know much about, like Charles Manson has been covered in documentaries and movies and books about it, about that, but all of these other little ones, people don't even know when these are, I mean, the fact that it was the founder of JPL, like one of the founders, I mean, that's huge. <laughs> it's like, why is this not, and L. Ron Hubbard was involved too. I mean, the, the whole thing is like, it's interesting, very I don't think all this stuff, I mean, you can find this stuff randomly over the internet, but I don't think anyone's ever put it together before, so. Well, you did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I have in the back of my book, in the appendix, I have uh, the top 10 spiritual LA scandals. Oh. So, and then I have the top 10 rock stars and so on. And I have the top 10 spiritual LA badass women. So <laughs> I think those are fun lists for people. Another, another uh, scandalous cult was called the Children of God. Okay. And uh, River Phoenix and Joaquin Phoenix were involved with them when they were children and Rose McGowan and some other stars. And they started uh, in Huntington Beach in the seven, early 70s by a bunch of Jesus freaks started... Uh, baptizing people in the water there at Huntington Beach. And then they uh, moved to L.A. proper. Okay. And they expanded super fast. They became worldwide and they had, I don't even remember how many people it's in the book. They expanded so fast. They're like, how did they expand so fast? Well, they had this ministry called uh -huh. Flirty Fishing. Flirty Fishing. Flirty what Fishing. What that was, was that the women in the cult were expected to go out and have sex with men, troll okay. bars, troll health food stores, uh, all over, just go, and sleep with them to try to bring them into the cult. And that was, <laughs> that was part of their ministry. It was, they are supposed to do it whether they wanted to or not. Married women, single women. And they also believed that adults should initiate children sexually. Oof. So they had these beliefs, and they had these beliefs that women were supposed to be out, even if they had families and children, out, sleeping with men, having sex with them to bring them into the fold. And That's one hell of a recruiting process. <laughs> What I found the most shocking, I mean, that's also shocking, but what I found was most shocking was that this practice stopped in the 80s when AIDS started, but it says on their website today, even though uh, we don't actually promote flirty fish anymore, we still believe it is scripturally sound. <laughs> I find that bizarre. Sorry. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's just saying that they probably still do promote it. They just do it very much in a different way. But they're script is scripturally sound. Come on. That means Come that, they're, that they, they preach it to their members. I so mean, is this, this organization is... still alive then? And mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm guessing that they've taken out the child abuse sexual they abuse. Have to. You, okay. I'm, I'm like, I'm hoping. <laughs> but again, we don't know what they're doing secretly. Exactly. You know, those are the scary things. Like that's one of the things that about you know, there's so much beauty. There's duality to everything, right? But there's so much beauty to spirituality and 
um, in in tapping into a connection in a world bigger than you and knowing that there is more uh, to your soul or to the collective, right? And But then there's this dark side mm -hmm. <laughs> that people use it for ma manipulation, for their own personal agendas, for brainwashing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's all under this sick disguise of mm -hmm spirit or teachings or holiness right and exactly. it's like and they get away with it because there's a lack there of evidence but there is a feeling of force and energy that people and it's however somebody interprets that and then says that that's what they need to experience or how they need to experience it it's just it's this fine line of something that isn't regulated you know there is a separation of church and state at least in the united states and at least there used so, to be no well yeah there used to be hmm. i mean go and uh, if, uh, if anybody ever w hasn't watched the documentary i don't know if you have the family did you watch that Catherine? oh i watched part of it you watched part of it, part of it yeah. Uh, the, yeah that it was pretty frightening you know, so maybe there's not so much of a separation, but there is there is this level of, you know, yeah, like you said, there could be some good things from Scientology, um, but there's also all of these weird things that they do, right? Absolutely. But it's like, it's it's okay because they do it under the disguise of this is their religious beliefs, and whether that's okay or not, it doesn't really seem to matter because they brainwash people to think it is, you know? Yeah. And like... I mean, how long did this practice of, you know, uh, taking a child's innocence or being the first sexual experience by an adult for a child go on before they finally decided that, oh, they needed to stop that. Maybe, you know, they could get in trouble for that, you know? Well, once was too many, right? Yeah, once but I mean, like... Once was too many times. Do you even know, like, how long that was even in practice, or you just know that that was once part of their beliefs? I know it started in the 70s, and I know that they said that it stopped around the time of the AIDS crisis. I don't totally remember when that was, if that was late 80s, mid-80s. Yeah, yeah, mid-80s. But anyway, yeah, they, 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 they toned it down because the whole world became more sexually uh, conservative at that time, probably. Look at that. That's, that's over a decade. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean. Oh, yeah. And there's, there's a video on YouTube, which I mentioned in the book, that's narrated by Helen Mirren. Okay. Uh, that has, unfortunately, a lot of stories from the survivors who, you know, it's pretty bleak. Anyway, on a brighter note. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, so let's switch. So, you know, just, just be aware when people are, you know, I guess uh, to, to transition, you know, when you're, when you're going and you're looking at all of these, take it for the history and for what the experiences are. Not saying that... Uh, Catherine or Liberate or anybody supports all of the teachings oh, no. and different things for these things. These are just, these are hallmarks or landmarks within um, certain types of uh, history that is part of spirituality for whatever that may be. And that could be for the good and for the bad, for the dark, for the light. And, you know, it's, it's you allow yourself to explore and see, you know, but that by all means, I think that that goes without saying, but just in case, you know, that, that doesn't mean we support that those, those, those places. <laughs> so many people have been drawn to LA. I was, everyone comes here because there's a spirit of, um, things are accepted here that aren't accepted anywhere else. So mm -hmm. people who are a little more eccentric or uh, people who are questing or people who are gay or people who don't fit in and, and there's this artists, people who don't fit in at their communities back home, they come here to Los Angeles because this is like, we welcome you here. Yeah. This is your home. Come. <laughs> we want more of you. And so in the spiritual realm, that also means that anything goes. And so some of these people who might have not been able to do such things in other parts of the world, Los Angeles has, has, been, has given them a place to expand for good and bad. Yeah, and it's been a, it's a lot of the Eastern teachers have found their way into Los Angeles mm -hmm. too. Like Yogananda would mm -hmm. be a good example of that. And, exactly. you know, um, m many others throughout history and stuff, they bring in the teachings from the East to the West and they find themselves in Los Angeles doing so. So it's, it's definitely been a hub that has been this vortex, as you say, to attract and pull people in. 
But in that, there's going to be all kinds, all makes, all models, all, all belief yeah. systems, you know? That's one reason we love Los Angeles, at least I do. And that's what I love about, about your book is that you're looking at all different belief systems in all different forms because it doesn't matter what somebody believes or practices it, it is a form of spirituality so whether it's a monastery or whether it's a church or whether it's you know a cathedral or the, i mean or a site or the a house that's founded you know it doesn't matter you, you're including because it's a part of the inclusion of spirit yeah, people have found spiritual meaning in many different ways. And um, we always have to, I, I, my guiding principle is if it's good for somebody, then great. So, I, for example, I um, have a little section on the Ethereus Society. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they worship extraterrestrials. Oh. And some people might think that that doesn't belong in this book, but I actually went and met them. They're gorgeous, wonderful people and the, one of the tenets of their faith is uh, acceptance of all religions and to work for the betterment of humanity and for uh, to increase compassion and so one thing i say in the book is who cares what they believe yeah if they're working on becoming better people serving humanity and increasing the compassion in the world that's got my vote yeah and and you know what like uh, for any of those people out there that love the ancient aliens, I mean, there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, theories and in, in supporting evidence that maybe a lot of the old texts and stuff were depictions of aliens instead of the beings that they described or that they described them to be. So we don't know, and don't know. so who who's who's right, who's wrong, what they what somebody believes. I mean, there's so many different points. Does it work for you? does it does it move you forward does it help you have a more fulfilling life and are you happier in in as a result having a ripple effect of positive and good for the people around you right yeah, i think that the main thing is is it making you kinder yeah are you so a kinder person in the sake of exclusive uh, inclusivity i want to include uh, i'm not sure how her name is pronounced so maybe a native person in the audience can send me an email and correct me but it it looks like it's spelled toy perina and she was a Native American shaman, very powerful shaman in the San Gabriel Valley. Okay. And the, um, as we know, the terrible history here and everywhere else of the white people coming in and uh, actually doing genocide on the Native people. And mm -hmm. the friars were at the San Gabriel Mission, and they did the, what was the last straw for Toy Perina. They... Uh, they outlawed native dancing. That was like the last straw. I mean, they've been doing everything, putting wow. them in schools and making them not wear their own clothes and so on. But the last straw for her was they outlawed native dancing. So she went around and uh, uh, gathered the native tribes and her power and her charisma, they all followed her. And of course, they were vastly outnumbered. This is why I just say she's such a badass because they went up against them anyway. They couldn't have possibly won. But, you know, just that fighting spirit of yeah. that and, and using that spiritual warrior energy to try to make a better life. Unfortunately, someone had tipped off the friars and they were captured right away and the men were tortured. And she was sent up north and forced to marry a white guy. And she died at age 39. But I just, just want to, this Native American heroine that we never hear about. Yeah. And there's a, some a beautiful mural uh, there's a couple places she's being honored in L.A. One is a mural up on Miracle Mile, and I have a picture of that in my book. And there's one down in Hawaiian Gardens, and there's one um, in another place that, but that's unfortunately supposed to be one of the worst drug-infested apartment buildings in Los Angeles, so I didn't go there. But anyway, this is, there's all these just wonderful uh, human beings in the spiritual life of Los Angeles that I, I would like us to remember and honor. Yeah, and to know, because it's all formed and shaped the history in the city and the culture and as a ripple effect I mean even if you're not from LA the the media and the ripple effect of how that has changed society as a whole exactly so we have our own little media going here where we can uh, read this book and know about an alternative view of life in Los Angeles, the spiritual view, which is that mm. many, many seekers have come here, have been welcomed, started their own, some beautiful, some strange, 
um, I say, <laughs> I say in the back of the book, you'll get, meet some people you love and some people you wish you'd never met, <laughs> like maybe yeah. the Freddie Fishers. And it's all here in Los Angeles. So I have decided to say that um, Los Angeles is the world center of spiritual awakening because it's open here. There's lots of Shakti energy pouring out if you know how to find it. I, I gave some guides for that in the book. You can really tap in and feel it and turn your mind off. You can feel this flowing spiritual energy here. I love and that. I, I still have friends from other parts of the world going, Los Angeles. I'm like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's here. The city of angels. Come on. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. That's not an accident. Now, Anything else you want to share on your book before I want to talk a little bit about all the different workshops that you do, too? Oh, I could go on and on, but I think that's a good sampling. Okay. There's a lot in there. <laughs> and so um, you're doing uh, workshops, and like everybody in the world, converting to Zoom and uh, doing, but when the the blessing of that is you're able to reach and connect to people in and around cities that in places that aren't just uh, Los Angeles native, right? You know, and local. Yep. Um, so what are some of the workshops that you teach? You know, because you really, you really um, weave in uh, Western traditional psychology with all of these uh, years of Eastern and spiritual belief systems and kind of have this soul um, discovery within. And so I would love you to share a little bit about some of the workshops. Oh, thanks. Um, we've developed a new six-part series. We started off doing tantric dating, which was quite mm -hmm. popular at um, oh. Right Hollywood. Oh, man. That would be, <laughs> so they do it once a month there, and we had to start turning people away if they weren't there, you know, if they didn't pre-register and on there that the class got so big that there can only be so much that you can do within the exercises. But yeah, it became definitely one of the one of the top classes and workshops that we held at Liberate Hollywood. Thanks. Yeah, it was great. And um, we couldn't figure out a way to do that online. And that people think Tantra, they immediately go, oh, you're having sex while dating or whatever. It's like, no, it's actually bringing love to the dating process. Um, yeah. Which is very foreign to conventional dating. There's no love involved. It's like swipe left or swipe right, depending on how you look. And that's about all of it. So, so people we found were very hungry to learn more about a Tantra approach which is um, Tantra, which is, uh, includes sex, but it's not just sex. It's sex positive, but yeah. sometimes we don't even mention sex. And um, so we, uh, we couldn't figure out a way to get that online, but we had also done a full day workshop at Liberate called Tantra, the Science of Creating Your Soulmate. Mm -hmm. And that was sold out and we had a lot of interest to do it again. So what we've done is we've taken the six hour workshop and just put the, uh, didactic part the teaching part into two hours and then here's some suggestions for how you can experience it some homework or yeah uh, you can go do these exercises yourself afterwards we just had the first one and people were staying after they seem to think that that worked so we have one coming up uh the second part in the series is tantra the foundation of conscious touch mm -hmm. and that is uh you know we're taught basically to touch people like this but this is like what would go under that how would you have a more of a mindful touch? So yeah. we're doing a two-hour workshop on that. And then we're going to add a six-part series that we're going to uh, start after the first of the year, that those will be two of the components, and you can take one or all as you choose. Oh, I love that. And I love that you can do it as like a piecemeal, too. That's a lot of things that I know with people's schedules and things along those lines sometimes – uh, when it becomes a six-part series and stuff, it's it's a bigger commitment for people, and some people like that, but some people are like, ah, I, I have an engagement on the fourth week, you know? So yeah, exactly. But I love that. So you're you're putting that all together for the beginning of the year. So mm -hmm. definitely for everybody that's listening, we'll um, put all the links down below and stuff, so you can mm -hmm. find Catherine's website, all other different information, any any ways to contact her, as well as like. The book is available on our website, um, so you can buy it there and support local. Um, it's also available on Amazon, too. So if you prefer Amazon, go for it. But if you want to support Liberate, you can buy it through us. Support okay. Liberate! <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to share, Catherine, before we wrap up? Um, I'm just excited to see how it's all coming down with you guys expanding and 
us yeah. continuing on with our work and I just think it's a very exciting time to be alive so it is all here together there there's a lot of transformation and in alteration a lot of pivoting going on for people and um take this and 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 learn and grow but there's never been a better time to stretch us onto the uncomfortable zone right and that's where true change happens and if my book can help you with your spiritual awakening then uh please uh, help yourself yeah i think everybody should oh and we have this place on here. I went there once. <laughs> Salvation Mountain. <laughs> yeah, Salvation Mountain. Oh, that's so great. That's a little outside of LA, but it's not too far. Yeah. I have day <laughs> trips in the back. So. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. Thank you. And I will, um, yeah, we'll put everything down below. Please, if, if you like this, um, like comment uh subscribe to our channel share this whether it's on podcasts that you're listening to or watching this on youtube um and follow in uh, Catherine for more books she also has a different book out as well is so many different workshops coming so we'll put all the links down below for that thank you all right thank you if you enjoyed this conversation like it subscribe and share it with your friends if you want some more amazing resources on your path of liberation, head over to liberateyourself.com and sign up for our mailing list. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram at Liberate Hollywood, all one word, or Liberate Emporium, all one word. Until next time, liberate yourself. Okay, well, uh, my name is Rebecca. Hi, I'm Reverend Doreen. Hi, my name is Travis. My name is Kimberly. My name is Lily, and I'm an energy healer at Liberate Hollywood. I really believe that everything is transmutable and everything is possible. I believe that we are swimming in a sea of energy and um, that this energy is love, even though I know a lot of the time it doesn't always feel like that. And I do pranic healing, which is energy. I'm a Reiki master, more energy. So what am I? I am a channel for energy to come through me to help you. There really isn't anything that you would need to do to prepare for a session other than be comfortable. The whole goal of the session is to provide you with a warm, comforting, soul and heart-centered environment from which to allow healing to occur. No, no, just come as you are. Always just come as you are. Uh, that's my job as a healer, to meet you where you are, to figure out what you need. Um, and to give that to you or to guide you also. Um, I'm so honored to be a guide in helping you to connect. To help re-energize you, heal you, change your programming so that you're no longer in your way of getting to things that you desire in your life. My objective working with clients, I guess, would be to help them connect to their divine self uh, so that they can facilitate their spiritual journey and their soul's path. In all forms of energy healing, regardless of what the practitioner says, it is up to the client to change their life. As a practitioner, we're serving as a channel or as, a, as an instrument for God to do the work, but it is up to the client to, to make better choices. I'm most passionate, I think, about being able to create a loving, supportive, and heart and soul-centered environment for clients to heal. I get really excited when I ha ex have a new client who's never experienced energy work before, and they tend to say that they were drawn or magnetized into the store, and they don't exactly know why or what for. And it's, a, it's an opportunity to introduce them to the divine, and I think it's a really beautiful thing to have that moment of awareness and that they're in that space of surrender because they don't have any expectations and they really get to see what it feels like to be a spiritual being. Once you activate that place within yourself, uh, it's powerful and it feels so good. It's very healthy for the body. I think it realigns all of your energy. Um, it connects you to source, uh, both within you and outside of you. It's really cool. 
It's such an honor and a privilege to be in the space where a moment happens and people have this awareness about who they are or they're able to grieve over something they may not have been able to before or they are able to see themselves for who they truly are in a more empowered and soul-centered way. But I'm trying to give you the tools so that when you leave, you feel, you feel connected. Come with an open mind, come with um, humor in your heart, and, and we'll get you on the right path for you. You'll learn more about yourself, you'll let go of things that might be holding you back in your life, and you'll feel more empowered about your decisions. I hope to see you soon. So, expect change. Radical change. <laughs> I laugh, but it's true. <laughs> Thank you, and I wish you love, peace, and higher consciousness.